Today's stories are about the desire for power and protection and how it can cost people, in these cases, everything. What if the price for that wasn't money, but a human life? For some people, these dark beliefs became a deadly reality. In the 1980s, a group of drug dealers believed that they could gain this kind of supernatural human strength if they were to give human sacrifices. The other story is about a family torn apart by the belief of witchcraft. These stories are chilling and they are about people who are willing to sacrifice anything and anyone to chase the power of the unknown. This is Red Rum, a series of unfortunate events. These bonus episodes are just like your usual weekly episodes of Red Rum, but shorter. You'll get two or three stories that all have a similar theme. The case I have for you today is from 1989, and it takes place deep in the Mexican borderlands near Matamoros. There was this young American, Mark, and he was about to have his spring break experience. It was a once in a lifetime experience, so he thought. Mark was a pre-med student, originally from Chicago, and then growing up in Santa Fe, Texas. It was the 10th of March when Mark's spring break experience began. His childhood friend Bradley swung by to pick him up from his home in Austin. And then the pair of them set off for South Padre Island. That's where the spring break season was really just getting started. But before they could settle into their beach vacation, they made a detour to Santa Fe to pick up some of their other friends. Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin joined them in the car. With their crew complete, the four of them set off on the road for the nine hour drive south, ready to soak up some of that sun and make some memories for their spring break. By the time they eventually arrived at South Padre Island, it was nearly midnight. But this was just the beginning of their adventure. The very next morning, they checked into Sheraton Hotel and Resort, and then they headed straight back out to the beach. The island was relatively quiet. There were only a few tourists around. But as the weekend rolled on, the island quickly filled with thousands of spring breakers from across the country. The energy was high and everyone was really excited to be there. Beer companies had even sponsored a number of different activities. There were surf simulators, there were gigs, there were free films, and there was even the opportunity to appear on TV. Now, in the midst of all this excitement, Mark did make sure to call home to his parents and let them know that he'd arrived safely and he was having a really good time. Later that night, Mark and his friends met a group of students from another university and the party really kicked off. They ended up going out, really partying hard and and really just enjoying that. And the next few days kind of turned into that as a routine. They'd go to the beach in the morning, they'd have a little lunch, then they'd have a lazy afternoon nap. And by the 12th of March, so just two days after they'd arrived, Mark and Bradley and their other friends began planning their trip across the border to Mexico. They left the island in the evening and they stopped at this sonic drive-in for a quick bite to eat. Now, while they were there, they met another group of university students from the University of Kansas. And they said they were also planning to go down to Mexico for a night of partying. So they all kind of clubbed together and headed there as a group. They headed to Brownsville, Texas, where they parked near the Gateway International Bridge. They then crossed the border on foot and they spent the night at Sergeant Pepper's nightclub before heading back to the island. It was on the 13th of March that Mark and his friend Bradley and their other friends all headed back to where they'd been the night before. They had had such a good time and it just made sense to them to go back again and spend the evening there. They crossed back into Mexico and they ended up at Los Sombreros, this bar with a really good atmosphere. There's loads of people around. It felt just as good as the night before. After they'd had a few drinks, they moved on to Hard Rock Cafe, which was equally as busy and the drinks continued flowing. It was around 2 a.m. that night or the following morning that things began to wind down. One of the group suggested they head back home and as they left, Mark was spotted leaning against a car just across the road. He was talking to a woman who he'd recognised from having seen around town, but things took a strange turn. The streets were crowded with thousands of tourists who were also leaving the bars. And that made it hard for Mark and his friends to kind of stay close together. One friend ran to a nearby alley to use the bathroom. And when he returned, he noticed that Mark wasn't where he was standing before. He had seemingly vanished. He hadn't seen him leave with anyone and there was no sign of where he could have gone to. 
The group were just confused. They all searched for hours. They even waited until after the bars had closed and they kind of sifted through the streets, but they were empty. They crossed the border back to Brownsville and they were hoping that maybe Mark had somehow made his way back there on his own, but there was no sign of him. And so after a brief wait, they returned to the island hoping that he would show up at the hotel, but unfortunately he hadn't arrived by the next morning and so that is when they made the decision to report him as missing. The search for Mark began like many other missing person cases in the area. It was quite routine. It was pretty normal for people, students, to be on spring break. They might disappear temporarily and then they'd maybe show up a day or two later with kind of blurry memories, maybe a hangover and apologetic to their friends but Mark's case was different. And his uncle worked at US Customs, and so he managed to really push for more exposure for his nephew. Both US and Mexican investigators suspected that there was something wrong with his case, and they suspected foul play. But they weren't having any luck in locating or gaining any real insight into where Mark had gone to. And so... Bradley was asked to undergo hypnosis to kind of try and remember more about what had happened that night. And it was then that he remembered he had seen something. He had seen a man with a scar on his face and this man had been talking to Mark just moments before he disappeared. The man had allegedly approached Mark with the strange remark, quote, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? But other than that, Bradley could not remember anything else significant. He couldn't even remember exactly where this had happened. The search for Mark continued on, but it was long and progress wasn't made quickly. Certainly not for his parents who had gone out to the area that he'd gone missing from a number of times and gone on different searches, but they hadn't found anything. But then... On the 1st of April, something happened. Mexican federal agents who were manning this kind of routine drug checkpoint, they saw a truck speed through the roadblock and just race on ahead away from them. The truck didn't stop, but instead of pulling it over straight away, they decided to follow it and see where it went. The truck crossed the border and sped on forward. As the truck headed out of town, it went towards the Santa Elena ranch. And the officers watched this. They stayed back a little distance and they just kind of waited Now, after about 30 minutes, the truck left that area. It returned to where it had initially come from. And so that is when the agents moved in. On that ranch, they found evidence of black magic, ritual sacrifice, and human remains. At the center of it all was a man called Adolfo Constanzo, a man who was known to locals as charismatic, someone with a ton of power. And in fact, Many people believed he had some kind of supernatural power. Essentially, he was a cult leader, this self-proclaimed witch who had convinced his followers that he could make them invincible. Adolfo was actually born in Miami and he was raised in this religion that mixed Catholicism with African spiritual beliefs. His mother was deeply superstitious and she taught him that spirits could be great helps, they could really um, give mighty power. And a young Adolfo quickly learned that power, especially power over others, was something that he desperately wanted. He moved to Mexico in his 20s and by that time in his life, he had really become involved with the occult and various different religious practices. But things progressed quickly he began implementing his own ritual sacrifices to spirits and his charisma drew people in, especially the kind of people who could be influenced by this, people who were on the edges of society, who were maybe drug dealers or criminals, people who wanted to believe that black magic could make them unstoppable. Soon, he had a group of loyal followers, people who were terrified of him, but also completely enthralled by him. They believed he had supernatural powers and he convinced them that human sacrifices would make them powerful and would make their drug operations completely immune from police prosecution. His followers thought he was some kind of sorcerer who could kind of shield them from bullets and bad luck. And so, on his orders, they began to kill. Now, at first, the sacrifices were animals, and they would kind of kill these animals and then pour their blood 
everywhere. They would leave them as offerings to the spirits. But eventually, he decided that animals were not enough to satisfy the spirits. And that is when he said he needed human sacrifices. His followers, probably desperate for protection and afraid to disagree with him, said that they would. And they did. When Mark crossed the border that night, he had no idea that he had walked straight into Adolfo's territory. One of Adolfo's men spotted Mark and saw an opportunity. They abducted him, they brought him back to the ranch, and it's there that Mark became one of the most chilling sacrifices. Adolfo's reasoning was that this would, quote, strengthen his power and his followers' successes in the drug trade. Now, to mark their chosen executioners and initiate them into this coal, Adolfo and his followers would perform this kind of um, brutal ritual. They used this hot blade to scar these marks into the skins. These marks, which resembled arrows or slashes, were made on the executioner's shoulders, on their backs, on their arms, and on their chests. And the process was extremely painful. The marks served as a form of initiation. They signified the individual's role in the group's gruesome practices, which included ritualistic killings and occult ceremonies. When authorities raided that ranch, they were horrified. They uncovered makeshift graves and the remains of a dozen people, including Mark. The ranch itself had been transformed into a place of horror. It was covered in ritual objects and different symbols that were meant to ward off outsiders. And so when authorities raided that ranch, they also found a number of um, different members of the cult, and so they arrested them. When they interviewed these members, one of them spoke about what had happened that night, and they gave excruciating detail. He said that a number of the cult members had mingled in with the spring break crowds, and that Mark had been standing in the street near his friends when one of the cult members had gone towards him and sort of lured him towards their truck. As Mark got closer, the gang members grabbed him and wrestled him inside. Now, Mark did actually manage to break free very briefly, but he was quickly recaptured and taken into another vehicle. To make sure this wouldn't happen again, Mark was handcuffed, and then he was driven back to the ranch where his remains would eventually be found. Mark's final hours were so, so awful. When the gang arrived at the ranch, they kept him in the car overnight, and then the next morning, the caretaker came and gave him some water and some bread. And then hours later, Adolfo and his followers arrived. They then began their gruesome ritual. They wrapped Mark's face with duct tape and then they walked him into a field. And there he was subjected to hours of torture before Adolfo took a machete and hit Mark on his neck and on his head, killing him. And as grim as that is, it actually gets worse. If you've heard of this case before, then you will know where I'm about to go with this. And if you don't, strap in. Mark's brain was removed and then it was placed into a, a pot and it was boiled. As for his body, his limbs were amputated so that he would be more easily buried. And then this wire was inserted into his spinal column. The wire, the point of it, was to allow them to eventually retrieve Mark's body once his, um, once basically decomposition had been completed. They then planned to use those bones in their rituals. Although authorities found the bodies of at least 14 men, to be honest, the number isn't definite and it varies from source to source that I looked at, but the minimum number that I saw reported was 12, the maximum was 15, and 14 was kind of the most reported number. Now, among those re remains that were recovered, the police found more than just human bones. They also found um, traces of drugs, they found weapons, they found things that would belong to the occult. And in one of the pots that they found, they found the remains of a goat's head, as well as other animal parts all mixed with blood and herbs. Faced with imminent capture, Adolfo ordered his men to kill him right there and then before he could be arrested. Adolfo left behind this legacy of violence and, and fear and the chilling rituals that were performed in the name of supernatural protection. <laughs> 
Christy Bamnew had always been close to his older sister, Magali. They grew up together with their other siblings in Paris and they were all pretty close, but Christy really looked up to Magali. So when she moved to London to live with her boyfriend, Eric, Christy was pretty down, but he knew his sister loved Eric and they were gonna set up this life together. Magali told Christy that he would just have to come and visit as often as he could, and he promised he would. And by the time he was 15, Christy finally got a chance to make good on his promise. He was gonna go and visit his big sister in London for the Christmas period. This was a big deal for him. Christy was a quiet, thoughtful teenager who'd been living a quiet life in Paris with his siblings. He was this kind of shy, kind-hearted boy who loved sport and he just loved spending time with his family. The trip to Newham in London was far from his home, but seeing his sister would be worth it. It was supposed to be a joyful reunion, a chance to catch up and enjoy that holiday period together. But what started as a visit to his sister's flat would quickly descend into horrific nightmares. Nightmares where the one person he trusted the most in the world would betray him in the most brutal way possible. The next thing that happened was that Magali made this frantic phone call to police. She told officers that Christie had drowned whilst in the bath whilst he was trying to escape an attack. But when officers arrived, it was clear that something much darker had happened. Christie's body told a very different story, one of cruelty and pain and unimaginable suffering. Magali and Eric were deeply rooted in this belief system that involved practices of African spirituality, which included a fear of witchcraft or kindoki. The exact reasons have never been made clear, but for some reason, Eric believed that Christy was possessed by evil spirits. And so he began a terrifying campaign to quote, purge him of these demonic influences. He accused Christy of being a witch and claimed that this young boy was somehow the source of evil within this house. Tragically, rather than protect him, Magali actually sided with Eric. It seemed that she believed the only way to save her brother was to go along with Eric's twisted fantasies and methods. The torture began on Christmas Eve. Eric and Magali, seeing Christy as some kind of threat, took to physically and mentally abusing him. The beating started with slaps and with shouting, but they soon escalated to something much worse and much more severe. Christy was struck with various objects, with metal bars, sticks, and even a hammer. They bound him, they deprived him of food and water for days, and they just locked him in this one room and kept him away from the rest of the family. Christy was probably confused and terrified. He did try to explain to them that he wasn't evil, but they just wouldn't listen. Every attempt to defend himself seemed to make Eric angrier and angrier. And it sort of added to his belief that Christy was hiding something. Now, of course, as the days went on, Christy became weaker and weaker. And as Christmas Day came and went, although he was still alive, he was in a really bad way. The situation escalated to a horrific climax on the final night of Christie's life. After days of physical and psychological torment, Christie was dragged into the bathroom. And it was here in this kind of cold, damp room that the most brutal part of the whole ordeal unfolded. Both Eric and Magali forced Christie to kneel down on the floor and kneel there for hours. And whilst he was there, they just inflicted more pain on him. This twisted belief that Christy was possessed led them to believe that they were performing a kind of righteous act, punishing him to rid him of the spirit that they thought had taken over him. As the hours passed, Christy's body, weakened by abuse, just sort of gave up. At some point, he was pushed into the bathtub. It was filled with water and he was submerged in that water and then just left to drown. It didn't take long and Christie's life came to a tragic end. The police investigation soon revealed the full extent of the horrific torture. Christie's body showed signs of severe blunt force trauma 
deep bruising and various different cuts. The pathologist confirmed that Christie had drowned, but the cause of death was not as simple as that. He'd been alive during much of the abuse and his death was the result of a prolonged period of suffering. He had over 130 separate injuries on his body. Magali and Eric were brought in for questioning and although Maggie was clearly very distressed, she had been complicit in her little brother's death. She had been manipulated by Eric for sure. He held this kind of powerful psychological control over her. Though she claimed to love her brother, it became clear that she had allowed him to be tortured. And this was all under the guise that she believed the uh, lies that Eric had told her about his possession. As the investigation continued, it was revealed that Eric was the main instigator of the violence. No surprises there. His belief in witchcraft and possession had convinced him that Christy was a threat and he used that belief to be able to justify his abuse. It does seem that he willingly and quite um, forcefully controlled and manipulated Magali, but ultimately she was complicit. She did nothing to stop the abuse. She was an active participant. In the months that followed, the case became a, a media sensation, which is interesting because I actually had never heard of this case. And it didn't happen that long ago. It was a little over 10 years ago, so it's relatively recent. The details of the abuse and the ritualistic belief system was obviously extremely shocking to the public. And people just struggled outright to understand how this kind of horrific violence had been inflicted by one family member to their own little brother. Oh, and yes, he was a little brother. He was a boy. He was just 15 years old when this happened. Christy was never a threat to Eric or Magali. They just convinced themselves that he was. The trial began in 2012 and Eric was found guilty of murder. Magali was found guilty of manslaughter. The court determined that she had suffered from diminished responsibility due to Eric's manipulation, but her actions still contributed to the loss of her brother's life. And so she would be held responsible in the same capacity. Eric was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years and Magali received a 25 year sentence. Thank you for watching today's episode of Red Rum, a series of unfortunate events. Usually I end these cases with a recommendation, just kind of bring things back into our reality. It's a lot of intense, pretty horrific information that we've just spoken about. So usually I recommend something like a film or a book to kind of take our minds off of what we've just spoken about. But now I'm producing two episodes of Red Rum a week. I haven't actually had time to read anything or or watch anything recently. Um, but what I wanted to do is just recommend a case that I have covered recently in case you haven't seen it. It is the Alexander family, um, the cult. The case itself is probably one of the most chilling stories that I've ever come across. It's about this father's obsession with control and this son raised to believe that he is a messiah and in the face of it all the mother and daughter are just left kind of helpless unfortunately in that case i'm diving deep into how one family's devotion to religion and to what they believe turns into a kind of dark reality that of course ends in murder and in this case multiple murder it's a haunting reminder of just how far faith and loyalty can twist sometimes with fatal consequences um i'll link it in the description box and i'll probably put it on the screen at the end of the video so you can click through if you wanted to have a watch of that case other than that i will see you next week or actually probably in a few days for another episode of red rum bye <laughs>